Well, there was a five-year-old, and, and, and the family was gathered together at family dinner, and the five-year-old was asked to, to say the blessing for the meal. And he said, Dear God, thank you for these pancakes. And when he finished his prayer, his parents kind of looked at him a little bit curiously and asked him why he thanked God for pancakes when they were having chicken. And he kind of smiled and he said, I just thought I'd see if he was paying attention for tomorrow night. Well, today we are looking at a prayer that takes, that takes place in the Bible in Antioch in Acts 13. And we're looking at it to see what it can teach us about God and prayer. Now, there are many, many prayers recorded in the Bible. You know, one is from Moses in Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 through 15. And Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let, you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider that this nation is your people. And he said, God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence does not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Almost sounds like Moses is kind of complaining. And, you know, oftentimes we'll, we, we, we don't want to pray. We don't think that God can handle it or we'll, we'll get in trouble by praying a prayer like this. But Moses is like, you know, God, you said this, this, and this, and I don't see it happening. So what are you going to do about it? The, 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 the prayers that are in the Bible are... Are, are real life and can relate to us. It, it's not always the, the churchy these and those type prayer and, and only good things that we're allowed to pray. And then, of course, there's David's prayer of confession and confession of sin and asking for pardon. That is all of Psalm 51, which which is a great prayer, David's prayer written as a psalm, and I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's, it's long, but you might want to write that down and then look at it a little bit later, Psalm 51. And of course, Solomon's prayer, you know, he prayed for not for riches and, and not for wealth. He prayed for for wisdom, knowledge, and that's what God granted him. And in the Bible, he is known as, as the wisest man or smartest man. But even, even with that, he made some mistakes. But his prayer was answered. And then the prayer of Jabez. There's only three verses in the Bible of, of the prayer of Jabez, but there's been a whole book written on it called The Prayer of Jabez, which is a good book to read if you like to read. And then Jeho King Jehoshaphat, he was, he was ill, he prayed, he was saved from the illness, and that's found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 5 through 13. So the Bible has some very powerful prayers in it. <clears throat> we last saw that with Daniel last week. And all of these prayers that are in the Bible show us one thing. 
that God does pay attention to our prayers. That's why, that's why we have those prayers in the Bible. They are there to show us that God does pay attention to our prayers. And in the book of Acts, we have many different recorded prayers, but we are looking specifically at the one found in Acts 13. And there's a quiz coming. So put on your thinking caps. There's a quiz coming in a minute. And we'll look at it. And there are several leaders in this, in this prayer, and, and, and they are fasting, and they're worshiping God, and they've caught God's attention. Now, I want you to look closely at Acts 13, verses 1 through 3, here on the screen. And it says, Now, in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manon, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, or the Apostle Paul. And they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. The Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. Okay. What did these men pray for? What did they pray? What did they pray for? So look closely at the passage. Do you see it? See what they prayed for? We have any answers? Okay, sorry, it's a trick question. <laughs> it doesn't say. It doesn't tell us what they prayed for, does it? All we're told, and, and this is part of the, 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 the neat part about this, all we're told that is in response to whatever they prayed, which we don't know because it's not listed, but what they prayed for, the Holy Spirit told them to set apart Barnabas and Paul to set out on an adventure. And this adventure would change the world as we know it forever. Now here's the thing, we don't know what they pray, but what we do know is they got God's attention. I mean, don't you wish that your prayers were like that? That you know when you pray you have God's attention? See, and the problem for us is we're not told what they prayed for. The only thing that we're told is, about their prayer is they fasted when they prayed. There's a connection between fasting and a connection with prayer. Verse 3, then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they set them off. Now, usually people fast for, for one of several reasons. People fast when they're grieving over the loss of a loved one. We see this with King David in the Old Testament. People fasted when they were repenting of their sin or the sin of their nation. David did this. Several other kings, good kings in the Old Testament did this. And people fasted when they sought protection from forces that they couldn't deal with. See, what fasting does is it helps to 
clarify our focus. It helps our minds and our hearts to seek God. So the main reason that people fast in the Bible is when they're seeking vision or they're seeking understanding of God or God's perception on a matter. And these verses in Acts tell us that prayer and fasting go together. Now Antioch was, was a relatively new church, a new group of people, and it, it had experienced lots of growth. And when the leaders in Jerusalem heard about the church in Antioch, they sent Barnabas and Paul to go to the church to teach the new converts about Christianity. Now Antioch is known for two things. First, it, the, the incident at, at Antioch between Peter and Paul and called the Antioch incident and, and Peter believed one thing which was, was merging part of the, the Jewish belief with the Christian belief and combining them, making it a works religion. In other words, if you if, if you want to be a convert, you have to do this, this, and this. But Paul said, no, it's by faith only. God has done the work and provided everything you need. And ultimately, Paul was following God's guidance and he was correct. And then Barnabas and Paul for a whole year taught a great number of people and they were well known in the area because of it. Now the second thing that the people of Antioch are known for is they were first called Christians at Antioch. Believers were first called Christians at Antioch. And Acts 11 tells us that. So Antioch's this church, it's growing, it has these teachers, and it has all kinds of potential. So, so why do they need prayer and fasting? Because if, if when they needed guidance, prayer and fasting was the way to get it. So for us, if we need guidance, the two best ways for us to get God's guidance is through prayer and fasting and combining the two. It's making ourselves available to God. Now, we don't know what the Antioch church needed guidance about. It was obviously something that they, they needed guidance and they were probably feeling uncomfortable about or they didn't know which direction to go into next. But see, God always has something bigger for us to accomplish. He had something big for, for Antioch to accomplish, but they didn't know what it was, so they prayed and fast. God has something big for us to accomplish. And if we want to figure it out, we need prayer and fasting. Now, one of the reasons we may may not be told what the, the Antioch leaders prayed is they had no idea what God had in mind. They knew God wanted something from them, so they, they prayed and fasted to make themselves available to God. But all they knew is there was something God wanted them to do that they were not yet doing. And so when they prayed and fasted, when they opened themselves up to God, 
God answered. In fact, God responded in a very big way. See, do you realize that when you allow God's Spirit to lead, like they did, they allowed God's Spirit to lead and they set aside Barnabas and Paul and the world was literally turned upside down. Because Christianity went from Jerusalem, it went to Antioch, and it is over here. That's quite a journey. And see, Antioch became the starting point for worldwide revival. And as a result, there were, there were a dozen churches throughout Asia as a result of Barnabas and Paul being sent out. Paul began a ministry of writing that resulted in the writing of half of the New Testament. And Antioch was one of the central hubs of Christianity in the ancient world. All because these men humbled themselves, they humbled themselves before God to seek his will. See, God has more for us than we can imagine and that we know how to pray for. So I think we need to pray like Antioch did. Not telling him what we want, but asking God to use us, to lead us, to help us to be more than we can imagine. How do I know this? Well, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 tells us that God is able to do immeasurably more or above and beyond all that we can ask or imagine according to his power that is in, at work in us. Ephesians 3.20 Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. God can do things that, that we can't even imagine or that we can't even ask for according to his power, the power of the Holy Spirit that works in us. Carl Bates, a former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, once wrote, he said, there came a time in my life when I earnestly prayed God, I want your power. And time went on and the power didn't come. And one day he says the burden was greater than I could bear. And he asked, God, why haven't you answered my prayer? And God seemed to whisper back this simple reply. With plans no bigger than yours, you don't need my power. Ouch, kind of. But it's true. I mean, we've got this verse that says God can do more than we can ask, more than we can imagine. But do we ask? Do we, do we imagine? So we need to pray the prayers of Antioch. See, I want to pray a prayer that gets God's attention that leads us to even greater goals than we can envision. I mean, don't you want to do that? Pray something that, that's greater than we can imagine? John Wesley used to fast twice a week. And, and my challenge to you, to you is to make it a part of your life. To pick a day to fast, to focus, to try and make it a part of your life every week to fast and to pray. 
Now, realize that if you choose to fast, this is not a requirement of God. It's not a requirement in the Old Testament. It's not a requirement in the New Testament. But God does amazing things through it and with it. But when people fasted, and we see that in Antioch, when people fasted in a way that pleased God, he paid attention. And the type of fast that God requires is one that humbles us in his presence. You know, it's one where, where we have some biblical goals in mind. You know, giving to missions or giving to the poor. See, Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 and 7 says this about fasting, the type of fasting that God wants. Isn't this the fast I choose? To break the chains of wickedness, to untie the ropes of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to tear off every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the poor and homeless into your house, to clothe the naked when you see him, and not to ignore your own flesh and blood? So let us pray and fast, requesting that God leads us to where he wants us to go. So I'll tell you two wheelbarrow stories. Everybody should have a wheelbarrow because if nothing else, you can have wheelbarrow races. But it's a handy tool. But back in the 1800s, there was a, a tightrope stretched across Niagara Falls. And of course, you know, the, the water is always rushing through and making this noise and, and, and you can hardly hear anything else because of the, the falls. And this man named Charles Blondin in the summer of 1859 walked on a tightrope above Niagara Falls several times back and forth between Canada and the United States as, as huge crowds looked on to see him walking back and forth. Once he, he, he crossed in a, in a sack, he did it once on stilts, he did it another time on a bicycle, and once he even carried a stove and cooked oatmeal. It must have been a small stove. Well, on July 15, Blondin walked back across the tightrope into Canada, and he returned pushing a wheelbarrow. And it was after he pushed the wheelbarrow across while blindfolded, he asked for some audience participation. And of course, the crowds have been there, and they've been watching, and they've been cheering, and, and, and you know, they had been thrilled when they saw all of this. And he had proven that he could, could do this. I mean, he could do it, no doubt. But now he asked for a volunteer to get in the wheelbarrow and take a ride across Niagara Falls with him. And it said he asked his audience, do you believe that I can carry a person across in this wheelbarrow? And the crowd said, yes, of course. And so he asked another question. Who will get in the wheelbarrow? Of course, nobody did. That's a real life picture of what faith actually is. See, the crowd had watched all of this. They had seen everything. They said they believed, but their actions proved they truly did not believe. 
And in the same way, it's one thing for us to say that we believe in God, but it's true faith when we believe in God and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, his son. At a job site one time, there were two men arguing, and they kept arguing, and, and they were working, and they kept arguing about who was the strongest. So there was only two possible solutions to solve it. One is, is fight it out, which, which isn't always a good thing. But one of the men says to the other, he says, I, I bet you a week's wages that I can haul a load in this wheelbarrow here that you'd never be able to lift off the ground. Fall, lift off the ground. And the other man said, okay, you're on. And so the first man grabs the handles of the wheelbarrow and says to the second man, Hop in. Of course, if he wheeled them over, the man would never be able to wheel himself back. See, sometimes we get ahead of God. We think we can do everything, and God will bless our actions. But we need to pray, God, I'm going to get in the wheelbarrow and I'm going to trust you to get me or us where we need to go. We need to allow God to wheel us where he wants us to go. And the only way we're going to get that ability is to give ourselves over to God to fast and to pray and to figuratively get in the wheelchair so he that uh, wheel barrel so he can wheel us wherever he wants us to go. Why? Because of this verse in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. And the only way God is going to accomplish that is if we allow him to accomplish it in our lives. And God will do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to his power. Amen. Would you please stand for our closing hymn, number 118, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, number 118.